Recognize Umbra Walker D01. Recognize the Caleb G D02. Hello team. Welcome to episode nine of Whelmed the Young Justice Files. I am everyone's favorite sidekick, Caleb, and everyone's shirt is fine. <laughs> Allow me to introduce Rich, who is okay because Lex Luthor vouches for him, <laughs> Howard. Oh, God. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode nine of Whelmed the Young Justice Files. We truly appreciate you spending some time with us here today. As always, if you would like to get in touch with us, please reach out. You can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files. You can email us directly at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com or swing over to our website, Crashing the Mode. Dot com. I don't pretend to be an angel. It just so happens that this time, I'm on the side of the angels. And with that housekeeping out of the way, allow me to turn it over to Mr. Rich Howard for... Hello, Megan! Hey, everybody. All right. So this week, we get Targets, is our episode. And this is where the release date went off the rails. <laughs> we were doing weekly releases... The release date on this episode was September 16th, 2011. The previous episode's release was March 11th. So according to the to the Young Justice Wiki, it was originally supposed to air on June 3rd. Thank you, Young Justice Wiki. But was postponed for unknown reasons on June 13th and 14th. It was briefly released on the Cartoon Network website, but then it was pretty quickly removed. I hadn't heard that. And then it was screened at the San Diego Comic-Con in July. That's usually in July and August. But then finally, after a six-month hiatus, <laughs> episode 10 of the show, Targets aired on September 16th on 2011. The in-episode date is actually fairly close to that, September 7th. The director was Christopher Berkeley, and the writer was Andrew Robinson. And because I like to point it out, we get some cool voice work in this episode. Yeah. A favorite of mine, Oded Fair, shows up. It's not a spoiler. He's Ra's al Ghul. Yeah, it's not a spoiler. No, no, <laughs> That's no. not a spoiler. No, no. We also have uh, Kevin Michael Richardson back in the saddle. Always good. And a very important person to the show, Mr. Greg Wiseman, has a little guest spot. He does. Do you, want to, do you want to reveal it now or tell, talk about it later? Oh, we'll get to it. Let, let's just drop that as a teaser. All right, sounds good. Keep people listening. All right, let's get on the mission brief. Just in time for your next mission. In the pre credit scene, we see uh, Roy, the now Red Arrow, stops an assassination attempt by Cheshire on a mysterious negotiator that's arriving to a summit between the D.C. countries of North and South Relasia for a peace accord. He manages to stop the assassination attempt, and Cheshire gets taken in by the authorities, only to find out that the negotiator is actually Lex Luthor. So Red Arrow and Lex have a little bit of a verbal showdown with <laughs> Red Arrow calling Lex out. But Lex, being just the brilliant businessman and negotiator that he is, so good. deftly deflects and reframes every argument that Roy makes against him into a positive about negotiating the peace treaty. Roy knows he's selling weapons to both sides of the war, but Lex sums it up. War income is pocket change compared to the billions made in investing in a unified Relasia. Isn't it better to have peace even if that scoundrel Lex Luthor makes a profit? <laughs> which is just beautiful. So Lex offers to hire Roy as a bodyguard, since apparently the League of Shadows has a stake in stopping the peace talks, but Roy turns him down. And I love this even more. <laughs> Lex is then says, oh, okay, so you'll do it for free. Because <laughs> it's I can, the I, right I, thing to do. <laughs> I can handle that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I love Lex. Uh, all right, so then we cut to our subplot here. We cut back to the cave where um, McGann is excited for hers and Superboy's first day in Earth High School. McGann shape changes into Megan Morse, who is her now now well-established alter identity. But Superboy has no alter ego. He's been living in the cave the whole time, and he has no regular name. So McGann 
suggests that the first name of Connor, uh, she always loved. We'll find out a little later why there's a twist. Martian Manhunter recommends the last name of Kent. <laughs> of course, the team doesn't know Superman's secret identity at this point, so they assume it's in honor of Kent Nelson, a.k.a. Dr. Fate, uh, from the episode Denial. And Connor has a great line there. <laughs> Wait, shouldn't my last name be, be Nelson? Nelson? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and let me just say, I'm so glad that I can start calling him Connor now. I know, me too. We've been calling him Superboy up for yeah. nine episodes. and oh, I, I love it. Okay. I love it. All right. So then we cut back to Relasia in the negotiations. Red Arrow is confronting Cheshire in jail. He's attempting to interrogate her. But then she is broken out by Sportsmaster. Roy chases them and manages to plant a tracker on their helicopter. He follows them to an elaborate compound, and we see there that the person behind all of this is, in fact, Raish al Ghul, head of the League. Raish admits that the League wants to stop the negotiations, but he also spots Roy up on the roof, and then Cheshire and Sports Master have a showdown with Roy cornering him, forcing him to run away. We cut back to Connor and McGann, uh, Megan, Connor and Megan now, in high school. McGann has convinced Connor to not wear his Superboy (laughs) t-shirt so that he doesn't have his secret identity blown because just his face, I guess, isn't enough. I don't know. Only to arrive at school seeing that almost every single person at the school are wearing t-shirts with League logos. (laughs) He's like the only one not wearing one. And in this scene, we see a number of uh, nods to DC characters that we'll get into a little bit later. So then we cut back to the action. Roy is jumping from the rooftop where he was cornered. Sportsmaster throws exploding javelins into the water after him. As Roy surfaces from underwater, he calls someone on his comms, admitting that he might need a little bit of help. And then he later meets with Lex who admits that Raish is a competitor, and they make some plans to protect the negotiations and Lex himself. We cut back and see Megan and Connor in class, and the class is uh, talking about current affairs, so they have something about the relation conflict on the TV. So Mr. Snapper Carr, who we will get to in a little bit, asks about uh, the history of of the relation conflict, to which Connor answers... In an almost robotic way, a very detailed historic a- account of the relation history, again showing the mysterious amounts of knowledge that the genomes have implanted in his brain. We also get a bit of Martian history because McGann, who's telepathically linked with Superboy, makes an analogy between the relation conflict and conflict back on Mars between the green and white Martian racial issues, which is something that occurs in the comics, which is the first time we've heard about this in the Young Justice canon. So then back to the action, Cheshire and Sportsmaster make another attempt on Lex's life, which is thwarted by Red Arrow and Aqualad. This was the person that Roy called in for help. He was undercover in the crowd. More League minions arrive, and a full-blown combat breaks out. Sportsmaster takes out thugs and goons like mad, and he faces off with Aqualad and actually wins. Super strong Aqualad, taken down by Sportsmaster. My brain still has a hard time wrapping around that. Anyway, back to school. We've now moved several hours, obviously, in both the conflict in Relasia and back home. So it's after school. Megan is now trying out for the cheerleading squad, which she's been invited to. I guess their team's called the Hornets, but the squad's called the Bumblebees. I don't know. Anyway, she ends up making the team, and then we get a shot of her basically in a cheerleading outfit, which we kind of got a shot of, if you remember, in the um, previous episode uh, during some memory reconstruction, which we'll talk about a bit in a little bit as well. So then back to the fight, Sportsmaster reveals that he knows about the team's mission in Bialia, and there's no good reason for him to know that. Has not come up at all at this point. He suggests that he is an inside source before Red Arrow and Aqualad team up to win the fight. An assassin nearly breaks the ranks to assassinate Lex when his bodyguard, Mercy, unleashes a crazy laser blast from an arm cannon. 
<laughs> revealing that she is either a cyborg or an android or just has some sort of weapon enhancements installed in her body. The two relations are impressed by the technology and are grateful to Lex for saving their lives, so they sit down to sign the peace treaty. At the end of all this, Roy overheard what Sportsmaster said to Calder. So he asks Calder what he's going to do about a potential mole on the team. Calder says he'll investigate, but he doesn't want to give too much weight, understandably, to anything Sportsmaster says. So they leave on that, along with Roy agreeing that he will be there. He appreciated the help that he needs to maybe let go of his being so snotty and arrogant. And if the team needs him, he'll be there for them. And in our final scene, Lex is toasting his success with a mysterious person out of screen. That turns out to be Raish, who apparently was not really trying to kill him. The two discuss how successful their plan was to reunite Relasia under LexCorp's political and financial guidance. But it's the final line that really gives us our first big reveal, which is Raish stating, and thus another corner of the world sees the light. So we now have for sure established two of the mysterious members of the light. And with that out of the way, let's jump right into feeling the aster. Yeah. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. I feel like I got to give you the first one on our list here. Oh, oh man. There's so much about this episode that I absolutely love. But Lex Luthor. <laughs> oh, Lex Luthor. Lex, Lex, Lex. Oh, Lex, I, I can't believe how much I love Lex in this series, let alone in this episode specifically. Yeah. He is a master manipulator. He's flat out using the truth when he's talking to Roy. Yep. He doesn't lie to him at all. No. He's like, yep, I'm, I'm going to manipulate them. I'm going to make profit from this. But ultimately, it's about peace. So who cares? Right. So why should you and, care specifically? Right. <laughs> and and he shuts down Roy's arguments so perfectly. Yeah. And Roy just has nowhere to go. He, no. <laughs> okay, I, I get it. Yes, fine. I'll work for Lex Luthor. Yeah, exactly. I can't believe we did a solid for Lex because that's what Lex manipulated you to do <sighs> and you did it for free. <laughs> and that's what I love about Lex Luthor as a villain. He's not super powered. Yeah. He's he's not even like Batman, who just is really well trained and also a great detective and has all these resources behind him. Lex Luthor is nothing but a regular dude who is really smart and just outthinks everyone. And charismatic. That's what that's the yes. thing that needs to get across. Like this this Lex in particular isn't just really smart. He's incredibly charismatic. And as much as I love Clancy Brown as the Lex in the Superman and Justice League series, Clancy Brown has a presence. I wouldn't call him charismatic in that role. In here, this this Lex is just wrong and right all at the same time. The previous versions of Luther, he's very imposing. Mm -hmm. He's very powerful. He knows he's in charge. He knows he's the smartest guy in the room, and he shows it with every single action and every single word he says. This version of Lex still knows all of that, mm -hmm. but he also knows how to play politics. Yep. He, he knows how to play the room, play the PR, play to the camera, and that's what I think makes him more deadly and more of a villain. Yeah. All righty. Man, I could we wax poetic about it. Lex is going to get absolutely going to get his own Secret Origins episode down the line. Yep. So we will yep. we will dive a little more into that. But needless to say, if you like the Lex in this episode, you will continue to adore Lex through the rest of both seasons of this show. Mercy, I was super stoked to see Mercy again. Mercy was a character that was introduced in the animated series, Superman the Animated Series, as a bodyguard. And she was human in that. And here it's a bit of a surprise we see. And we I don't think we ever really find out whether she's a full-on android, whether she's a cyborg. I don't know what the deal is, but I'm glad to see Mercy present in the show. Of course, we get the mole. Like, oh man, now what's happening? So now we're opening up a few more layers to the larger plot. It starts to get personal with the team. Yeah, I don't know anything else to say about that. But that's not going to be crashing the mode. Well, I, I think... What we can appreciate about that is because it is a very classic 
tropey villain ploy. Mm -hmm. It's super easy for the villain to drop a little bit of information and say, oh, I I guess I have some secret inside knowledge, huh? You should be careful, especially in a team setup. Yeah. And the show has already given us some suspicious teasers. Yeah. We know just in the context of the show, not knowing any spoilers, there's something weird about Artemis. Right. We we have Roy jumping out of the team, but kind of jumping in to help them at times, mm-hmm. or at least that relationship has continued. We had a little bit of suspicion from Robin about Miss Martian. Mm-hmm. Also, Connor was literally created by a branch of the light. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. So even though we have not been given any solid evidence of a traitor, mm-hmm. there is enough in the show to give this some weight. Yeah, absolutely. And it's such a cool way to hook viewers because now we're second guessing everything. Right. And I think at this point we get, we know enough about the show that we're like, ooh, all right, everything that's happening seems to be happening for a reason. And if they pull this off, then maybe this is going to be, hmm, what? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Superboy, Superboy. Oh, oh, Superboy. <laughs> Superboy makes me smile. I know he does. Go for it. Man, so, I mean, just, uh, we, we talked about the names a little bit. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in Crashing the Mode because there are some spoilers. He knows a lot Yeah. in this episode. Yeah. And I, I, this goes back to a little bit about, we don't know exactly how much he actually knows but he keeps revealing that he knows a lot from what Cadmus programmed into him. Mm-hmm. And based on what we were just talking about the mole too, it's definitely an echo back to his programming, which can make us think what, because he, he doesn't just answer the question. He answers it in a bit of a rhetoric or like Northern Malaysia and Southern Malaysia were, you know, split during the great powers during world war two. Like he's very robotic, which is creepy <laughs> in a way. But it also reveals that there is some way for him to access this knowledge that he has. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's kind of funny. He, basically, some random guy asks him a question. It's not like he got cued or triggered by some sort of hypnotic suggestion. No. But he still rattles it off robot fashion. Yeah, because he got asked a question. Like, and he, like, accessed the file or whatever. Yeah. yeah, so that that's making us think, if we're really digging into it, is he always like that? Does he always just have this encyclopedia knowledge? Yeah, like like an encycl- encyclopedic knowledge of stuff, but not human nature or behavior. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so it just adds a little bit more to the puzzle of what Connor is, really. Yeah, I agree. We'll talk about Connor and the names and some other stuff in a bit, like you mentioned. But uh, the other thing I loved about this episode is all the fantastic callbacks to the DC universe. Marvin and Wendy are callbacks to the 70s Super Friends show, where Marvin and Wendy and the Wonder Dog were kind of the the normal self-insert characters for the Watcher in the Super Friends show. And we get Marvin and Wendy a glimpse here, and they come back again a little bit later. We get Mal Duncan, who is a kind of a classic non-powered Titans ally, in the comics, and we get a nod to Mal here. We get Karen Well, who we, we know from the comics. Uh, well, you know what? This is going to be crashing the mode, so we'll talk about that in a bit. But what I will talk about is Mr. <laughs> Snapper Carr. <laughs> Mr. Carr, the professor. For those of you who don't know, Snapper Carr was a non-powered ally to the Justice League back in the 60s. He was a... Snapping finger guns, beatnik with the soul patch and the whole deal. So, like the way they represent him here with the soul patch and kind of the retro look is fantastic. And I'm so glad that they kind of fold folded Snapper in. He's made appearances in some other animated shows and series as well. But I'm I'm just glad that they gave a nod to him here. A couple other details that I really liked. We see a very similar back and forth between Roy and Cheshire. That we see with Wally and Artemis. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. We we know that Young Justice organically develops relationships. Mm-hmm. 
So seeing these bones of a structure start to form here tells us that there might be something more to that down the road. Mm -hmm. And plus, I, I just legitimately enjoy cheesy superhero supervillain banter <laughs> yeah and i love and chester's it. good at it too and she's so good. and it's nice that the, that even though it is the similar dynamic it's actually flipped because chester's being the kid flash in this in this scenario the the mm-hmm. the flirt and the although she does it better because <laughs> because wally's wally um right. but it's nice that the roles flipped in some way you know and it, yeah i like it a lot I also love the appearance of Rachel Ghoul. Uh, I've said this already. Rachel Ghoul is one of my absolute favorite DC characters. Yeah. I love this version of him. I love the fact that he is voiced by Oded Fair. Yeah. It just sounds right to me. Yeah. Knowing that he's part of the light, knowing that he's part of the ongoing plot is just so exciting because I love Raish. Because he's kind of he's kind of the opposite of lex to to a point Mm -hmm. lex is in the public light but he's the master manipulator he's the businessman raish is the same manipulator the same ruler but he does it all from the background yeah and they have they almost have opposing goals so to have lex in the episode say you know raish is a bit of a rival it kind of makes sense because at its core lex is out to manipulate the world as it is currently the social structure of the world that exists. He's learned to manipulate all of that structure. Raish is out to, to, he's an eco-terrorist in the classic sense. Like he's, he'd be happy if we could take, you know, 7 billion people and cut them down to 1 billion and then, you know, let the earth kind of recover a bit and let, you know, what's left of the human race grow and, and change and evolve. But society would be massively changed in a way that Lex couldn't control. So you see them as head-to-head people, and when you see them like working together in this episode, if you pretend that they are both have similar goals, or they both have opposite-ish goals, then it makes you wonder what in the world brought them to the same side. It's interesting to me, and how it pans out is stunning. And the last thing I really love about this, and this is going to take us right into our next segment, is the back and forth between the two storylines, mm-hmm. the fact that we started with Roy, who's not even part of the team, yeah, and we are jumping really between his solo mission and Megan and Connor at school. Right. <laughs> and no one else on the team, really. Yes, Calder shows up for a little bit for an awesome fight scene, but there's a huge shift in what the show is about in this one episode. Yeah. It's not just the team doing a mission. But there's no problems. It doesn't feel awkward. The pacing is still on point. There's no disruption in the momentum. Mm -hmm. And let's just go right into Canary Debrief because you're going to talk about this a little bit here. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Let's do it. Stick around. Class is in session. All right. Here's the deal. If you're writing a story, if you're going to have a subplot, make sure that you're using that subplot to full effect. There's no Kid Flash, as Caleb mentioned a minute ago, in this episode. And there's no Kid Flash for a reason. Like he said, there's not a team. It's not really a team mission that they're on. And as far as the moving the plot forward or character development or character focus, they're not needed. Having them there would be extraneous. So don't put them in. Narrow it down to exactly what you need to tell your story and nothing more. If you're going to put a character in, you need to ask the question, why is that person present? <laughs> why are they there? If they're not there for a good reason, you need to take them out. A classic example from relatively modern literature is Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time. The character of Matt Coffin was supposed to be two separate characters. And it seems a little counterintuitive if you've read that series because there's like a hundred main characters and a thousand detailed supporting cast characters. But for some reason he decided that, you know, having that character of Matt, the plot elements that Matt represented be split into two characters was redundant for the story. So he merged those elements into two characters, the aspect of the chance and the aspect of the old battle master being reborn. If you have two characters performing the same role, take one of them out or change the dynamic. This was a problem that Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. had in the first few episodes, for sure, at least the first half season. They had two super agents that were basically exactly the same. We didn't know anything about their backstories or histories, and there was nothing different about them. 
You also had two scientists who were almost literally the same because they were referred to by one name. So you don't have enough dynamic to work with. As the show got blown up halfway through the first season and it got the dynamics were changed a lot, all of those characters developed into their own personalities and it was fantastic. But it wasn't a great way to start. So in this scene, in this show, we have no certain key characters, fan favorites even, because we're focused on something else. The scenes with Megan and Connor, the scenes with Megan and Connor in this, it is they do a few different things. One, they break up this crazy action and tension, right? They're, but they're not just filler, and they're not just comedy. These scenes with Megan and Connor, they give information by helping us understand a little bit more about Relasia in the DC universe. And they establish supporting cast characters, two of which will be crucial to season two. But it also develops Connor and Megan as characters as they learn about living in human culture. We, we see Connor trying to grow within the context of the team, but it's interesting to see, even though he responds to Mr. Carr's question with this robotic answer, as soon as he comes out of giving that bunch of information, you see him with a level of compassion in Connor that we hadn't seen really previously. Like, he's like, I don't understand why they're fighting. They're all humans, right? And it, it's a fairly understandable question, but I think it's the way it got delivered and the way he was animated and showing that there's a part of him that wants to be that hero. And then McGann's character, <laughs> this whole episode was about laying groundwork for McGann's character. And we'll get into that in Crashing the Mode a little bit. So the basic takeaway of this episode is if you're going to have a subplot, use it to full effect to move the plot of your story forward and only put the characters in that you need to do to tell the story that you want to tell. And if you're putting someone else in, your reader's going to know it's going to feel forced. Don't let it feel forced. Absolutely. As much as I love Robin and Kid Flash, I did not miss them in this episode whatsoever. Th this episode was perfectly balanced. The story was told beautifully. I didn't need them popping up to just lay in some quips or lines yep. or anything like that. This was just a great story. It was very well written, very well portrayed. Absolutely. With the debrief done, let us move on to crashing the mode. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. We have a lot to talk about here, a lot of fun stuff. Of course, we are digging into the realm of spoilers. If you do not want to know what happens later in Young Justice, specifically Season 2, <laughs> stop listening, because we're going to talk <laughs> about it. And if you are still here, consider yourself warned, we're going to spoil some some facts yeah. here today. I'm going to get into a few little things first, and then we can get into the bigger ones. How's that? Go for it. So Mal Duncan, I mentioned earlier, Mal Duncan is this uh, classically non-powered supporter of the Titans. He was actually a part of the Titans for a long time uh, in the comics, or for a period of time in the comics, but just felt kind of out of place because he didn't have any powers and he wasn't trained in a particular way. The thing is that in the comics, he eventually becomes the second Guardian character, which we see in season two, which was fantastic. And the way that they had Mal transform into Guardian and take his place on the team later on, I thought was was great and tons of fun. In addition to that, we get Karen Beecher. Karen Beecher gets introduced in this, and I saw her in the background, I saw her in the credits, and I was like, oh my gosh, are they going to do Bumblebee? And then we didn't see Bumblebee in this first season, so I was like, oh, I guess maybe it was just kind of a nod, and they're called the Bumblebees, and that's cute. And then we get into season two, and we find Bumblebee is critical. <laughs> critical to the plot line and the success of the team in season two. And we get into the diversity, which you may have heard uh, Ishan from Total Party Thrill podcast and I talk about during his interview. We start getting into that representation of male and female characters of different racial and cultural backgrounds. It's fantastic. And we get a nod to that here. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So I'm excited. I was excited to see Wendy and Marvin too, as much as the I watched that show when I was a kid. It was just a great smile, an emotional memory. And Marvin has handled so well, and, and uh, we, will, we will see them all again a little bit later in the season. I think one of the things I love about seeing Karen and Mal at this point in the series, there's not a lot of emphasis put on them. No. But they're used properly within the context of their existence at this point. Yeah. And when season two rolls around and we see who they are and their involvement, to be honest, I forgot about them. You forgot they were introed in season one? Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely did. And in season two, when we're seeing all these other characters, I said, what is going on? Who are all these people? 
And then as I started rewatching season one again, then I made the connection of who they are. Yeah. And it made it that much more rewarding because then I, I found that connection. Mm-hmm. But I, I liked it because it wasn't just bringing someone out of nowhere. They had an origin. Mm-hmm. But the show didn't shower them with so much attention that we knew they were going to be someone later. Yes, exactly. The show used them properly in their context. Yeah, absolutely. And they we even see this conflict between Mal and Connor, this almost accidental conflict between Mal and Connor when they first meet. But it's not some macho bravado. It's it's Superboy not understanding what's happening around him. And we get to see the heroism of Mal right off the bat because... Connor sees Marvin with his classic t-shirt, which is an M symbol in a kind of stylized Superboy shield or Superman shield symbol. And of course, Superboy was told to take his shirt off to go to high school, to go to school and change his shirt. So he's like, what's, what is up with this shirt? And he's like, dude, what is happening? So Mal comes up to defend Marvin, who clearly can't defend himself. So we get to see that heroism of Mal right off the bat. And that he will go to toe to toe, go toe to toe with his friends, and so it was a it was a nice bit of conflict that later on you see Mal being you know in season two being as accepted part of the team. And so speaking of Connor and Megan, I, I think we can transition into their parts of this crashing the mode pretty easily right now. I think one of the best parts here is when Connor picks up Megan's books. <laughs> it's like, what did you want them to get wet? And she just kind of melts. You're going to carry yeah. my books? And he's like, what, do you want him to get wet? Because she got water dumped on her. And she's like, oh, my gosh. And you're just seeing all this, like, again, this cliche stereotype teenage TV girl thing. And, of course, now we know that's because her entire life and understanding of, of Earth culture and who she wanted to be was that. And she's seeing it come to life. And extra come to life, we find out, because the reason she said Connor's always been my favorite name is because... Connor is a character on Hello, Megan. Right. The the boyfriend of Megan Morse in the TV show she is modeling her identity off of. I was just like Kid Flash and Connor and Robin watching that episode with my jaw open, watching. And Superboy's like, maybe it's a coincidence. And then, like, the Connor character shows up, and she's all, Connor, it's so good to see you. And Kid Flash is all, yeah, that's a coincidence. (laughs) So, of course, we are referring to a later episode in this season. We will get Mm -hmm. to that pretty soon here. Consider that a little bit of a teaser with a, a very soon payoff. That's right. That's right. And then, yeah, let's get into the big the big crashing. Yeah, this mole. So the mole is Roy. We've talked about that the mole is Roy. Um, I'm not sure if we talked about exactly why the mole is Roy yet. We may or may not have. I can't remember. It's been a while. But turns out that Roy's trigger word, first of all, his handler is Sportsmaster. And second of all, the trigger word that triggers him to shut down and give them all the information is Broken Arrow. Broken Arrow is a code word, and we hear Sportsmaster use it during the fight. So here's the thing. In the scene where where Roy is backed up against the edge of a building with a long fall into a river, you hear Sportsmaster say, "Looks, you know, I hear you go by Red Arrow now. Looks more like Broken Arrow. And you see Roy's, his face doesn't relax, but his eyebrows kind of raise and relax. And at first you just think it's a, just an expression. But then when we cut back to that scene, what we see is, what we now know is Roy waking up from having been in this hypnotic trance and telling them information because the opening scene is Roy like almost sighing like like his head being foggy and then he looks up and Cheshire waves at him like hi like did you forget about me kind of a thing or like good to see you now that you've woken up again kind of a thing and we don't get that now like now we get it but in the time it was just part of the scene it has a completely different context and then, of course, he he runs and jumps, and then Sportsmaster, you know, quote unquote, tries to kill him, but knows that he isn't good, that he'll survive, right? And as someone who watched season one without any of this knowledge, mm-hmm. I did not put together any of these clues. I was blown away yeah. when Roy was revealed to be the mole. Oh, no, me too. Absolutely. Hands down. I'm like, are you what? 
Are you kidding me? The the moment at the end, we're gonna get jump to the end because we're crashing this mode, man. The, the moment at the end when he goes in and he's talking to Batman in the Justice League in the uh, the Watchtower, I up to even that point, I did not know what was happening. I was like, hey, they've already they've already said that there's no mole. We're good. It was just like a whole illusion or whatever. Oh my gosh, nuts! And then rewatching this again and going, oh my god. But it still carries impact. That's what I love. Even yeah. having watch this series so many times even breaking down all of these spoilers and clues as we're talking about them now mm-hmm. when we get to that final moment and that it unfolds on screen yeah. of Roy being the traitor yeah it's still a sucker punch i still every time oh. <laughs> it does and then going into season 2 you're just like i oh my gosh it just Everything that he does in season two and why he does it, him questioning his reality and just that that two episode finale of season one and and what that the implications of what that all means is just like oh you gave us the satisfying ending, a satisfying ending to 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 close the plots that we, you introduced in season one, but just managed to leave a couple of strings hanging that we really want to see pulled on, mm-hmm. right? Yep. Oh my gosh! So brilliantly done, just brilliant. Absolutely, uh, that's just what I. That's why I love the show so much because the payoffs are always there. It's so well carried out. Yeah. Even having watched it so many times. Yeah. Every time. It's still always and, that good. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the fact that Roy is the outsider to the team really helped to kind of couch that a little bit, a little hide that in a way. Because, you know, we were thinking they were focusing on team members, right? And Roy was the, I'm the outside person. I have better perspective than everybody else, right? My God, I don't know. I don't know. I can't even, I can't even wrap my head around it. It's just <laughs> the plotting, the planning, the editing, the, the story. I want to see the storyboard they were using. And I think the last thing we want to touch on briefly here in this Crashing the Mode segment is a little bit more about the white and green Martians. Oh, yeah. So so in this previous episode, we had already talked about in Crashing the Mode, we got this glimpse of Megan in the cheerleading outfit, but there was no memory of that. She hadn't done any of that yet. So then it's a question of like, wait, so now she's in a cheerleading outfit. Was this a vision of the future? Like what's happening? But what we also got was they introduced the image of a white Martian couched in this um, this kind of reconstruction of Superboy and Miss Martian's memories. But now we, it's after we saw it that we find out about the White Martian conflict is now canon in the, um, the Young Justice universe. Having not known anything about Miss Martian going in, this may be an absolutely, uh, you know, established part and detailed part of her history that I just wasn't aware of. And, and there are going to be very few things in the series that I'm going to be approaching, that I approached without much knowledge of, right? I know who Snapper Carr is, but I don't happen to know anything about Miss Martian. So as a fresh watcher of this particular character, just rocked me in a great way. It's fantastic. All righty. Well, I think we can consider this mode successfully crashed. And let's jump back into things with a little bit of fan service. Yeah. What have you got for us, Rich? I'm playing off last week's kind of nod to the Ballad of Barry Allen. That song sent me on a bit of a search uh, when I first heard it to hear if there were any other superhero-related songs out there. And uh, the one I found was called Ring Capacity by a group called Kirby Crackle. It is actually a song about Green Lantern. It's about diving into the, the knowledge and the emotions, I guess, or like, you know, what it's like to be this character. And in this particular case, describing a, a fight between Sinestro and the Hal Jordan Green Lantern and, and what it feels like when the ring is depleting and you are about to die and who you are as a person and how you got there, how you got to be a normal human in a in a super-powered universe. It's a great song. We got a link to it in the uh, show notes and we'll have a link to it on the website. So go uh, check it out. It's pretty rocking. And of course, if you produce anything cool about DC in general or Young Justice specifically, please get in touch with us. We would love to feature you here on Whelmed. The website, CrashingTheMode.com, has different fan art every week. We have our resource page showing links that we have shared here, different videos, different websites, all that kind of stuff. So if you are out there making something, get a hold of us so we can put you up there. 
And with all of that being said, it is safe to wrap up this mission and head out of the cave. Everybody, thank you so much for spending some time with us this afternoon and talking about Young Justice. We love it so gosh darn much. We appreciate (laughs) you being here, and we appreciate you listening. As always, until next time, feel the aster. And don't forget to hashtag keep binging YJ and stay whelmed, everybody. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our computer is voiced by Madison Ray. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.